Cause you took my scars, bruises and broken heart And numbed all the pain Show me how to heal And now I don't feel broken anymore This is All Heart with Paul Cardall Hi, everybody. Welcome to All Heart. I'm your host, Paul Cardall. You're either tuning in because you're a fan of this podcast or you love The Piano Guys. And I've been so fortunate and blessed to know both of those uh, artists that are in that group for quite some time. But today's focus is Stephen Sharp Nelson. I remember when he was a cellist in high school playing with quite a few local musicians in Utah, and I was fortunate to begin having him play with me and do some shows with me around the country. But then he evolved and partnered with John Schmidt, one of the musicians and pianists that I admired as a teenager. And really it was John that inspired me to, you know, I could do this, maybe I could do this. And uh, so I have a lot of love and respect for the piano guys, these dear friends. Well, Stephen is I think he's one of the best cellists in the country. In fact, he's one of the most popular cellists in the country. John and Steve started out by taking the idea when YouTube started. What if we take a Coldplay song and a Taylor Swift song, two of the most popular groups, what if we take one of their songs and we merge it together and reimagine it? Now you see this all the time on YouTube and TikTok, people trying to reimagine other artists material and creating music videos, hoping that they will go viral. Well, Steve and John hit it at the right time, and the formula and the algorithm that they created enabled them to have hundreds of millions of views to the point now where they are playing arenas worldwide, selling out, and we're going to get right into talking with Steve about these things. Steve is very passionate about his faith. He is a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. He is adamant about speaking about those things. So he has a lot to say. So let's get right into this with my dear friend, Stephen Sharp Nelson. There's the man. How are you? Fantastic. Good. So good to see you, my friend. Well, Steve, you look you look, you look, look the same, just a couple years older. Hmm. Well... On account of all those birthdays I've been celebrating. Well, it tends to happen. There's, you know, I, I, I say they flip it over and have an expiration date. So at least we know. That would be good. Although that would take some predictive science. And you certainly have been one that de- has defied that expiration date. Well, you just, you know, you, you get a younger heart. But technically, if you add my heart, the age, I'm, I'm like 59 years old. Okay, hold on. So let's see. But wouldn't, hang on, wouldn't it minus from your life, not not add years? Well, if you take a heart that's 19 years old when I got it, and I was 36 year old, and you do the math. <laughs> I don't know, man. I'm thinking you're 36 and you like, you, you got a younger heart. So that should be, I mean, as far as your cardiology, that, that sounds like you're younger than you actually are. Well, I think so. Maybe I, I, I wish I... I wish I, I feel younger, but you know how it goes. You you think you're still young, but then you trip. <laughs> well, I mean, from, has the heart, I mean, I haven't gotten an update from you for a while, from a, for a while now. What, how is the heart, normally the body eventually rejects it, you told me once. Well, I'm, I'm beyond that now okay. because I, I, I'm beyond the 10 years, so my heart doesn't reject. What happens is you're taking immunosuppressants to treat it, uh, because it's a foreign object. It's somebody else's DNA. It's right. a virus. Right. It's like a pregnant woman with a baby. Okay. It, uh, and so so your other organs are damaged. Okay. In the long run, your uh, low immune system, the kidneys, you're more likely to get diabetes. Okay. Um, but fortunately, I've had those scenarios where I almost were diabetic and they wanted to do insulin. And that's where my wife steps in and goes, well, hold on. You go to McDonald's. <laughs> right. Why don't you why don't you not go to McDonald's for a month and and let's see what happens. Get off the Diet Coke 
And then sure enough, she's right. My numbers go down, yeah. so I'm fine. She's like, you know, you, you preach the word of wisdom, you might as well live it. <laughs> yeah, most of us don't even understand it, let alone live it. So that's a good, I don't know, that's pretty good advice. <laughs> yeah, well, it's good advice. And so every day is a, you know, every day is a gift. Every day I wake up just excited to find out what God's going to do today. Hmm. Is it, yeah. well, and, and maybe, I know what you mean by that, rather than don't care, you don't care about the things that he's asked us not to care about. You know, when he talks about, take no thought for tomorrow. Well, we have to think, we have to take some thought for tomorrow, but obviously what he's referring to is what you're eating tomorrow, what you're wearing tomorrow, forget it. It'll take right. care of itself, right. just like I feed the birds and the lilies, you'll be fine. But just worry about the important stuff. So I get what you're saying. For sure, the less you care about stuff like that, the happier I think life ends up being. Yeah, it, it's hard to let go. But at the same time, when you hit 40, 45, mm -hmm. you're like, you know, I did, I, I went, I did everything they told me to do. I went to mm -hmm. kindergarten, went to school, I went to high school, I went to college. Oh, I was supposed to get a job. I was supposed to be ambitious. And I tried to provide for my family and this and life happens. And then you wake up one day and you're like, I, I could be dead in like, like I used to think that all the time, but then you get a heart and the actual reality is I am 40, 48. Yeah. So right. it's like, what, what is it all about? What is it for? And what does it mean? So you get into mm -hmm. all the, the heavy stuff. <laughs> well, I wonder, you know, and I wonder how, what, if we were to really ask Paul, if we were to be able to have an intimate conversation with every human being on this planet, I wish that were possible. How many would really be able to answer with any sort of belief, assurity, hope to the big three, the big, big three? Where are we from? What are we doing here? Where are we going? Yeah. And um, I was actually, every time I travel, uh, I like to... Um, I like to just strike up conversations with people if they allow it, if they allow it, you know, if, if the headphones go in and the hood goes over, I get it. Right. But um, it's so fascinating. And sometimes I even feel a temptation to just be like, I'm tired. I don't want to talk to anybody. But I always I always am grateful if I'm able to strike up a conversation with somebody because I always learn something profound from that individual. And I've had so many incredible conversations that I, I wish I could enumerate in detail. Yeah. But one in particular, I remember. Um, I was sitting on the plane and, uh, and I'm talking with this guy and, and I'm like, you know, um, it's, I, I, we, we started talking about, I always try to work in God into the conversation because I'm always curious as to what people's perspectives are. Right. I used to be in sort of the Mormon mentality, which doesn't exist anymore. And I hope doesn't exist. And I use the word Mormon intentionally where it was like, I've got to convert this person. Right. I've got five minutes with them. I've got to convert them. I used to have that mentality and I think it was wrong. It really was. I think first and foremost, Christ didn't go to people and say, I, you know, he's in the first five minutes, he's like, I'm going to try to convert you and get you baptized within the next five minutes. No, it was so much more about love and understanding and searching that person's soul and trying to really give them hope and peace and joy is, is what his true ambition was. And, and certainly there are things he wanted them to do, uh, of course. But so I've sort of changed my mentality. It's more about like, is there an instant friendship we could strike up? Is there, are there things that I can learn from this person? Or can I, I remember one, and I'm sorry, I'm tangential because I'm ADHD. You know this, you know me very well. But I'm in an Uber car and I love the Uber conversations I get to have. And often I just ask the person straight up, what's your relationship with God like? And um, where I'm in, in Utah, that question can be political, but in the rest of the world, it's not. It's just interesting. And I've had people tear up right away when I've asked that question. And it's fascinating to me, yeah, that, 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 we're, that we're in that situation. But anyway, getting back to the airplane story, I'm on the airplane and I, I asked that sort of question, you know, what's your relationship with, like, with God? And they, they started being very open with me. And it was very beautiful how they described their relationship with God in their own way and their background. And, and then somehow I got on this question of the big three. Well, have you ever thought about where we're from, what we're doing here, and where we're going? And this person was like, I couldn't answer any one of those three. And so he goes to the left and he's like, but my minister is sitting right next to me. And I'm going to ask him. And I'm like, oh, man, am I going to get an earful from this guy? You know, because did he think I was trying to, you know, be 
be proselytizing here, which I wasn't. But so he turns to his minister fan of the plane. And he's like, hey, answer this guy. He's asking me, where, where have we been? What are we doing here? No, sorry. Where are we from? What are we doing here? Where are we going? And the minister goes, huh, I've never really thought about that before. <laughs> I'm like, what do you mean you haven't thought about that before? Does this minister read his Bible? Does he read his Bible? <laughs> well, I don't, I don't know. I mean, to each his own, right? But Most Christians know. Yeah, right. But my point is how many of us, yeah, and how many of us really know the, or can answer confidently that we've got at least an idea of those three. And I think that's what we eventually, Paul, yeah. search for in our lives as we're doing, as we're working, as we're building relationships with people. This, These are the three questions that we often are searching for either directly or indirectly. Yeah. And I think that's very interesting to have that perspective. You know, the older I've gotten, the more I've started to realize it doesn't matter where I came from in the sense that God doesn't really tell you too much because he wants you to focus on right now. He doesn't tell us too much about the future. We have our past. We know that we came from the Father, those that believe in God. We And everybody has their different idea of what that meant coming from the Father. But here we are right now in the moment. And I've been studying uh, John. And John 17, Jesus, for those who love Jesus, his greatest plea was that we stop being pluralistic in our beliefs and that we be one, one with him, one with the Father. And I think it starts by having those conversations on airplanes mm -hmm. to where we start to feel united with people. And, you know, it goes to this whole world of uh, the Gospel Music Association. <clears throat> you know, mm -hmm. when you go to these big worship concerts, what's fascinating to me, Steve, is that these are unintentional musicians with the intention of helping people know that they love Jesus, that they want you to uh -huh. feel and know Jesus. But what happens is people from every walk of life, every denomination, they all come in under one umbrella. God uses music because it unifies the body of all the parts of the body. You can have these beliefs, these beliefs, these beliefs, but there's one common belief in the Christian world, and that's Jesus. And when the music starts playing, create these moments that are unifying the entire body. Um, I, I love those points, Paul. I love that we talk about music being the universal language, and it becomes cliche almost at this point, platitudinal to talk about it in that vein. But I think it goes so much deeper than that. What I've discovered lately in my life is faith is about being present. And like what you were talking about, not dwelling on the past, not worrying about the future. Fear negates faith and uh, shame of past or regret of past or un an unrepentant past, meaning that we're, that we're unwilling to turn away from it and turn towards Jesus, means that we lose faith. We, our faith erodes it. So what I think music does, and so when you think about the context of this, how much time per day do we spend being present? I'm awful at it. I really am. I'm constantly thinking about, okay, what did I do yesterday? And it should, how do I fix that? Or what, what's going on tomorrow? It's being present. Once we're present, our faith can be so much stronger. And I think music, we talk about it being the universal language, but I think it's a tuning fork. I think it really resonates through our soul to the point where it actually could push future and past further out to the spectrum on the edges and help us to be totally present one with another and right. with ourselves. And what I've discovered right. about faith is that faith begins with how we talk to ourselves. And if we're stuck in the past or worried about the future, our talk to ourselves is negative. And if you're finding yourself doing that, whoever's listening, if you're finding yourself negative talking, it's probably because you're unable to be present or un uh, or, or having a difficulty being present. Well, I, for, I, I'm in your same club. I'm with you. But that is where we've got to stop the negative right. self-talk and realize. And music really helps us to tune into this. If you're finding yourself in the past or in the future uh, dwelling or, or being negative or worrying or, or, or fear negating your faith, turn on some music that tunes you into the present so that you can be present, build your faith, and talk to yourself more positively. If your music doesn't help you talk to yourself more positively and help you hear God's voice, 
on a right. regular on, on as regular a, a basis as possible that's where you need to change your playlists and be your own dj stop letting the ra radio be your dj or somebody else you are the dj of your own soul so you you spin the playlists you've got to determine what playlists are going to help you be present which will build your faith and increase the positivity in your self-talk and when you do that life improves dramatically it's a simple change that brings about great things and that's why i love music and that's why i do what i do i hope that it tunes me and tunes those others uh, tunes others around me to the love of god to being present and to feeling in the moment so much that we don't erode our faith with regrets of the past and worries of the future so steve it sounds like you're recommending a mixtape so if we go back <laughs> let's you do have the your mix guest. tape that's you, right you have your boom box you have your boom box you've got a your 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 a case of cassettes that you got from sam goody or media player music land how difficult was it to make a mixtape back then that oh. was it was a substantial effort it was it I, really was you had to get a pencil there was the perfect <laughs> size to rewind the tape right it, right. it was my favorite thing. You could cut and slice if you had the right masking Ooh, wow. tape. You were getting too. You were getting technical. Man. I know. I didn't splice ever. You had to go to Radio <laughs> Shack and become a monthly member, so you got your free double D battery. <laughs> and anyways, okay, you were so five songs, Steve. Five, you're talking about songs that yeah. people can listen to to dial in. Okay, mm. give me five. One of them. Great question. One of them can be a piano guy's song. Okay, all right. I, but the other four, what? What? I don't, I'm not really familiar with their music. I, I've heard. I, I've heard of them. <laughs> a friend was recommending. Yeah, it's it, it's it's the isn't that the the family of five that play pianos? Yeah, that's right. The five Browns. Yeah, same same people. Yeah, the piano guys. <laughs> that's okay. kind of a funny. Right. Uh, you know, I think. Um, Oh, I've got so many recommendations. The, we don't have any excuses, though, to follow up on that on building our own playlists. Um, I have found that uh, there, there's just been sometimes music. I think music plays so many roles in our lives. and One of them is a messenger. We hear the right song just at the right time sometimes if we're listening. And that message is so incredible. I would say, can I just say that listen to anything from For King and Country? I love their music, I love their message, and I love their production quality. And that just fits me. I love that they're willing to not just simply play cliche, and they're not simply pandering. I think they really are digging deep, but being poetic at the same time without oh, being inaccessible. So I love them, and I love both of them. I've, I've talked with them, I've collaborated with them, I love them. Um, I would say that the song Redeemer by Paul Cardall. And I'm not doing this as a shameless plug. It really is transcendent. I think wow. it's, and it's, and I still remember the moment when you and I worked on that together. Yeah. <clears throat> and everybody needs to know that, um, that this song was so organic. You know, Paul, you had the piano part written out and I wrote some strings to it. And I remember the moment in the studio when you said, that middle part needs to be at the beginning. Hmm. And I said, really? He said, absolutely. And we shifted the song and you used inspiration in the moment and the spirit in the moment that told you to restructure the song entirely in order to provide that tuning fork moment, that resonance, that resonant moment that people can really tune in. So that's just one of those songs where I just think it was an inspired construction on your part to put it the way it is. Well, that clearly was you and I in our early stages. We had such a love for the yeah. Redeemer. And I, you know, oddly enough, uh, you know, I have received, and you've probably received hundreds of emails of people who've listened to that song. And one in particular was the young man in Baghdad who his family was killed in the first mm -hmm. Iraq war and was contemplating taking his life. And he heard that song in a military yeah. base. And in the moment he said, he heard all, uh, say, you need to live. So I thought it was interesting that it was a Christian, um, I guess, a, yeah. a song about Christ, and yet it was a yeah. Muslim who felt it because there yeah. were no words. That's the magic of instrumental no music, too, is that there there could be that connection yeah. across faiths, maybe a little bit more, because there wasn't an off-putting yeah. uh, reference to something that somebody doesn't believe. So I think that's very special, too. And, and 
Well, you uh, you really took that. To I appreciate level. that, Paul. For those of you who don't know, so we need to take you. a little bit of a tangent here. For those of you who don't know, Paul and I, he took me to a gourmet lunch at Noodles and Company when I was in my early 20s and said, Steve, why haven't you done your own album? And I said, I'd never want to do that. Why would I ever do that? And you said, why not? And you put you put that question to me and said, you have to do this. And I think part of life is surrounding yourself with people that believe in you. And because I don't believe in myself a great deal of the time, I'm a negative self-talker sometimes, I really am. And hmm. I'm sort of the Vincent Van Gogh and needed the Theo uh, Vincent's brother, who supported him no matter what, uh, whether it was by correspondence or in person, who was his only patron at times for his art. Right, right. And I felt like that was a Theo moment for me, Paul, when you just said, and, and it was you, you, the way you approached me was so faith filled because there wasn't any misgiving or, or, or a lack of confidence. It was just like, okay, when are we going to do this? Not if. And so everybody needs to know that Paul produced my first two personal albums, the very first albums I ever put out just on my own. And they're like, I don't know, how old are they? Four, 15 years old, maybe at this point? They're, they're 15 years old. And it's crazy because every time I look at the uh, iTunes charts or the Amazon charts, they're always up there. <laughs> they continue to consistent. And that's the sign of, of a classical musician. Mm. Because if it was new age, it would have fallen off the I charts. See. There's a little but more it's classical because it's timeless. Mm -hmm. It's there's nothing electronic in it. Right. It's it's very raw. It's very sincere. It's very real. Mm. But it's the, the music that's on there. But you had been playing around town with everybody. You were still in high school. Yeah. yeah. Playing with different musicians. <laughs> that's and right. you know, even even when you were you know, we were at Noodles and Company. I knew <laughs> the value and and wanted, you know, we, we wanted John Schmidt to see that as well. Mm -hmm. And um, eventually he did. Yeah. And of course, you guys have taken off and you're playing arenas and all kinds of amazing things. But, <laughs> and but backyard I, family but reunions. But, I, yeah. but I'm glad I could uh, spend $5 and, and buy some noodles that day. <laughs> Paul, I, it was, that $5 was immortally valuable because uh, I, I can't express enough gratitude to you. And I have before, but I need to do this publicly on this podcast. Thank you for believing in me. Thank you for being there for me. And thank you for sticking your neck out on your line from a producer standpoint. And willing just to not... And, and you didn't... If you have an, if anybody's listening, if you have an opportunity to be a Theo to somebody, to be a Theo to a struggling Vincent, uh, and to be a producer in some fashion to somebody else, and to help them discover their own worth, that's what you did, Paul. You didn't come into the studio and say, okay, Steve, for the first song, we're going to do this. For the second song, we're going to do this. In fact, I was shocked at how little structure you had them. You just said, Steve, come into the studio. And I was already at a full-time job. You know what I was doing? I was sitting a real estate model. I brought my cello with me to the real estate model. And when people weren't coming in, I would be writing music because I had a studio yeah. appointment the next day and yeah. I didn't know what I was going to play. So, and you just said, you come to the studio and let's just play. And um, the lack of structure was so good for me because it just was this, this blank canvas. And you handed me a palette. And, and I used that palette on this blank canvas and you just sat there and you're like, that's great. Keep going, keep going. And I, I love that. I think that was a great way f for you to produce me. That, you know, that's something, yeah. that's something I had learned from Sting. Hmm. When I watched his doc, the documentary about his transition yeah. out of the police uh -huh. and he rented the villa in Tuscany and he brought in all those players. These were players he had seen perform. He'd worked with them. And so he decided I'm going to get out of the way because when you interfere in art, you're not able, you would, if Theo had basically said, no, you got to do it this way, he wouldn't have been able to meet the full measure of his creation. Yeah. And, and I'm just a firm believer, get out of the way. Yeah. Even, you know, even when you're composing your own music mm. and you go to present it, I've always tried to get out of the way of the song. So, mm. you know, people yeah. bring up Redeemer you know, I don't know how many millions of streams that's got, but nobody has a clue we were involved. Yeah. And I think it's fantastic.
I love that. I love I love letting music lead. I, and, and I think this is a great analogy of our relationship with God. We often get frustrated with him because he's not there at the drop of a hat, right on time, telling us exactly what we need to do. That is not the kind of God he is. And I felt like you, that's a great analogy of you in that studio. You enabled me, you, you gave me gifts, you gave me an opportunity and then said, go. And I made some mistakes and I wrote a couple songs that nobody will ever hear because they're not very good. And, but you weren't kind of control freak about it, you know? And when I asked you questions, you provided guidance, but sometimes you didn't, you just said, well, figure it out, you know? And I think yeah. this is, this is why it's so funny because we're a little, it's a little ironic how we sometimes demand that God be somewhere right when we need him with the exact instructions and other times right. we think he's too much a part of our life and get out, you know, stop giving me commandments. It really is that the, for God, if you have children, you start to understand this. You start to look at your children and you say to them, you would rather see them fail and pick themselves up and learn than succeed, succeed, succeed. And uh, that is the relationship that I've grown with God is I've learned that failure isn't in his vocabulary. It just really no, isn't the way not. he looks to his no. things. It's failure is a label. We, we, failure is a label that we use, that we misuse on success we don't yet understand. That's right. and, and for me, it's, music's helped me with this, Paul, because for me, life is success and practice. Those are the two categories. And sometimes they're, inter they're interchangeable. They're just interchangeable. Right. So uh, there's a, I, we get a lot of practice on this earth, and God loves practice. He loves effort. He loves to see his children go after things. And he loves to sit back and help however he can, but it's often in a way that enables us to be creators rather than insist he create everything for us indefinitely. So, and that's where he wants us eventually. He wants us where he is. I mean, you read the New Testament. It's very clear that Jesus is like, I want you to have everything I have. Paul, how incredible is that? No politician, no person in power, no authority on earth has ever said that. I want you to have everything I have. It's always, it's always possessive. Yeah, it's, it's just so beautiful that it's just like, look, everything I have, I want you to eventually have. It's a beautiful thing. Well, he's, he's, you know, he's the God that bleeds. He's the God that mm -hmm. weeps. Yeah. He, he's not, he, he, this is why I think he's such a, a, a great God, because there are many ideas of what a good God is, and everyone has a different divine source they turn to. Um, but, but Jesus I can connect and relate with Jesus because he suffered. Well, he's more relatable than some other kind of God. Plus, we know for those that are, that are Christian, we have the faith that he conquered death. He overcame um, that, that great thing that, you know, for doctors to take my heart out, mm. you know, clinically, you're, you're dead. But we've come to the point where we can put a heart of another person in a, in, in me mm. and raise me from the dead. So that's just something we're doing now. We're sending Shatner to the outer space. <laughs> right. Okay. So, cool. so if we can send Captain Kirk <laughs> to outer heart. space, they can, exactly. <laughs> if you could raise me from the dead, you know, I don't understand why we have to doubt the reality that there is some almighty powerful thing that is God. Um, and that he has personality and characteristics and he's a father and he loves us and he wants us to succeed. Yeah. And, but it's interesting, Steve, because I've thought a lot about this when we're little and we're in a good home, yeah. not everybody's in a good home, but when you're little in your good home, like ours were, you don't worry about much. No, you don't have a lot of stress, no. but then everybody starts to fill your head right. with the dogma. Everyone starts to educate you on what to think and feel. And then we spend the rest of our lives trying to figure out which one of those things belongs up here yeah. and what stuff should we get rid of? We want to be like children who are free and happy. They have responsibility and on the, in their minds, they know <clears throat> making their bed stinks, you know, doing these chores stink, but there's no, major 
traumatic experience for a lot of those that are in really good homes. They're not being abused. They're not, you know, and so you long for that. You want to go back for that. Yeah. And so what I'm saying is we get indoctrinated with so many philosophies mingled with scripture that you have to start and clear off the table at some point in your life and go, okay, let's start putting back on what really matters. Yeah. Versus there's, there's things that are visible that matter and things that are not visible. That don't well, and, and this is, this is the magic of Jesus. I think this is the beauty of Jesus. You've nailed it so well. And it reminded me of a 21, uh, the, the 21 pilot song stressed out, which we actually, I did a, I did a total reimagination of that song for our new album yeah. that just came out on Friday called chill. Oh, nice. And I nice. reimagined that whole song because he talks about how, I wish I could turn back time to when my mom used to sing me to sleep, but now everybody's telling me you got to go out and make money and succeed. And, and I'm totally stressed out That's and right. it's exactly what you're talking about. So I actually rewrote it as if he did turn back time and you can hear it in that vein. But um, what it gets me thinking about is, is this, this, this problem of filling our life with so much and, and misunderstanding so many things and, trying to get back to child that childlike nature which is what jesus yeah. asked us to do he is mm -hmm. so funny his disciples are all arguing about who's going to be in heaven you know they were obsessed with this question of course they were obsessed with this question especially because in the traditional jewish beliefs they talked about these concepts of heaven and hell but it was so vague so it's like jesus teach us more about heaven because i want to know who's going to be there and am i going to be there and he like hears them fight about it and and he just says you know what pause Come here, come here. And he, he asks a little child to come and he sits that child in the middle of them and says, this is it. This is what heaven's like. I'm sure those disciples are like, what? What do you mean? Like a, a child doesn't understand very much and is kind of obnoxious sometimes and meant to be seen rather than heard because back then right. children were, were that very much that way, less than less so than now. So, or more so than now. So it's, so it's just interesting to think about, okay, We've got to become more childlike in order to be comfortable in the presence of the Savior. And so it's interesting how you, how you point that out, where it really is, it needs to be a return to that, I think. And, and there's so much that we pile on ourselves and so many yep. things that we're trying to grapple with and understand for sure. So let's find out what song number three is. <laughs> okay, yeah, we've got to circle back to Song that. number three, so, five um, greatest I'm songs. The first was... Anything King and Country, then Redeemer, and track three. Yes. And I, I want to say, well, and this relates to what you just said. Good, yeah, yeah put the pencil in the mixtape. Paul, you talked about something that I've been thinking about. Uh, Jeffrey Holland, who's an apostle in the church that I attend, is was so beautiful about the way he portrayed this. It's, it's got me really thinking about this. And I wish I had the exact talk reference and I'll find it so you can put it in your show notes. But um, he talks about how can we insist on not suffering in life and be okay with coming face to face with someone who suffered it all on our behalf. And, and, and we talk about, so it got me thinking, and he meant this benevolently, not like, you know, be ashamed of yourself. He meant this benevolently, benevolently that we should appreciate and, and, and understand our suffering and how important it is. And to me, Paul, you kind of said it in what you're saying, but sometimes we think we suffer so that Jesus, who descended below us all, can lift us up. And that is such a critical part. But sometimes we need to remember that we suffer so that we can better understand and appreciate what the Savior went through as well. Because all of a sudden, he has 100% divine empathy for us. He can understand everything that we've been through. I don't know how it works, but it does. He's the only person that understands. You know, I could say to you, oh, your mother's died, my mother's died, I get it. Well, kind of. I can kind of get it. And that's important, that empathy is important, but Jesus can say, I know exactly what you're going through. But in some way, when we suffer, we can empathize in a micro essence with what he suffered with. And so all of a sudden, there's this divine connection. If something in life does not increase your relationship with Jesus Christ, get rid of it. Or God, or your loving God, if you're not Christian, a divine presence that you feel is necessary for you to progress in life. If something precludes, inhibits, or negates 
or even lessens your ability to establish a more positive relationship with Jesus. Yeah, there's a, I think you're referencing the sermon that he, Jeffrey Holland gave called, called um, it's called not as the world giveth delivered that April 3rd, 2021. Okay. Thank he you. Quotes uh, Jesus has saying, let not your heart be trouble. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. Mm. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you when mm. it's interesting. Cause if you just read it as I will leave you, I will not leave you comfortless. You'll right, a, right away go, well, hold on, wait a second. Even C.S. Lewis said, when sometimes when I go to the Lord in prayer, it's as though he slams the door in my face. It's because you only read that part of the scripture. And that's why mm. you cannot read scriptures out of context. You have to continue reading. It says, I will right. come to you. Yeah. Meaning, I'm on my way. Yeah. I'm on my way. So the question is, like when we're kids and we want that ice cream from mom who promised to get it to us if we did this or that, even though we don't deserve it, but she's going to get it for us. Do we have the patience not to remind her? Hmm. You said you do this. You said you do that. You said you do this. You said you do that. Do we have the patience to accept the fact hmm. that our mother is not a liar? Or be entitled. That God is not a liar. Mm -hmm. Fear is the liar. F fear is the one that would say to you, mm -hmm. you're not valuable enough. You know, and I remember coming to Nashville mm -hmm. and I went to CC Winans church and her son, Alvin, who's one of the pastors said, I think the reason people don't seek God or even think about God is because they don't know how valuable they are to God. And that we think we have to go and access him when in reality, he's a reckless God. You know, the Corey Asbury uh, tune that everybody, everybody right. is singing is that um, God God's, is reckless. Yeah. He will mm -hmm. break down the walls uh, to come and rescue you. He will leave the 99 to come and rescue you. And I think, I think for me, yeah. the biggest release of anxiety came when I stopped working for his love. Stop trying to earn righteousness by obedience. Because when I accepted that I am loved, I am worthy, that's when this new power came into me and said, I want to be good. I want to do this. So instead of trying to work for it, it's a reverse of you are loved into it. You lose the desires. And it's a whole new perspective of grace I hadn't understood for 45 years of my life. Grace is tricky. Grace could be a tricky subject. It is actually very simple, but it could be a little tricky. I think it's, it's complicated by, it's complicated, you know, how many times do you, can you go to a, 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 a you know, a seminar and some guys there, you, say you want to learn a business yeah. or something. You get every speaker up there giving you bullet points. Right. Well, by the end of two hours, you've got 10 different lectures, 10 different bullet right. points. And you're like, <laughs> yeah. and that's, that's why I just go back to what Jesus said, you know, because if he fulfilled the law, the 10 commandments are, are, are narrowed down yeah. to just two, two love. I think, I think it's, it's difficult because I think the adversary, I think the adversary wants us to understand that his love is contingent upon our works. And, but if he can convince us enough about that, we can start to believe one of two things. One is that we have to work harder, 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 and we'll never get there. And that's horrible. That's really bad. Or the other one is we don't have to do anything. We don't have to do anything. And I don't think that's what Jesus wants from us either. I'll give you an example that was really poignant for me. We're on tour and, and Paul, you've, you've experienced tour. If anybody has experienced tour, they know that tour is so hard. I mean, it, it is like right. we fly to a location, we play at that location, we do a pre-concert for people, then we do a concert for people, then we do a post-concert or a meet and greet, and then we get, uh, and then you're like all amped up because you're trying to amp yourself up, but you got to go to sleep, and you got to go to sleep on a bus as it drives to the next city and throws you around like a washing machine. You get in a little, you know, coffin-sized bed just for convenience in case things go wrong in the night. 
right. and and then you get up and you do it all over again and you're so haggard and, and if you lose sight of what you're doing and why you're doing it forget it like it's over like you, that's i i once asked my manager i was like how do people do this you know how do keep people keep doing this he's like drugs i'm like oh okay well i'm not willing to yep. do that he's like okay well find something so right. so i so uh I get on this, I, I'm in this situation where we've been on tour for a long time and I'm so haggard and I'm on the side of the stage and I'm saying a prayer. I say a pre-show prayer always, but this one was like, I'm done. This was the prayer that we've all prayed at one point in our lives or at many junctures in our lives where it's just like, I can't do this anymore. And I was praying and I said, Heavenly Father, please, God, please just don't make me go out on that stage. And I was saying this as the announcer was warming up the audience, getting ready for us to enter the stage. I don't even remember where the venue was. I think it was somewhere in Europe. And um, I'm just like, I can't do it. I want to just go into the corner, crawl into the fetal position and cry. That's really what I felt like doing because I was so tired and so just had zero energy. And and I, I pray that I can play to the one because honestly, sometimes audiences yeah. just are like, they're not totally into it. So you just say, okay, well, there's, you know, God would put a whole concert tour together only for one person. He's not utilitarian like we are, where we look for a number of likes and followers and audience members. He would do it all for one. So I, but that wasn't working either. Oh, let me help, help me pray to the one. Oh, I don't feel like it. I just don't feel like it. And I remember I was so done. And I heard what I considered a voice. It's an impression. However, God speaks to you. You got to learn that because it's according your language not mine and he uses a little bit of humor he uses a little bit of a little bit of, of tough talk tough love sometimes because i need it i'm a little dense and um so he just said my son he starts off with my son i felt that strongly my dear son when have i ever given you the impression that it's all up to you hmm. you and then he says you just go out there on stage you just show up and I will take care of the rest. And I think that's kind of, my dad would joke about this. You know, my dad, he's, he's a jokester. As I was growing up, he'd always say, you know, most of life yeah. is just showing up. And I was like, in that moment, I walked out onto that stage, I sat down and I just felt carried that whole night, even to the point where I was floating six inches off that chair, because I learned that yeah. that's what Jesus yeah. really wants us to do is cast, not only cast our burdens at his feet, but when we are all tapped out, but we still have to show up, all we have to do is show up and he'll take us the rest of the way. But he needs us to get to that's that right. point of desperation in order to learn enough about ourselves and to learn how he intervenes and helps us rather than helping us at every single little juncture. So we become slothful and we become entitled. So at that point I had given all that I could right. and I had nothing left. And he just said, you show up and I'll take care of it. And I think God wants us to show up. He loves effort. I think he wants us to grow and learn and progress. And we can't do that as a stick in the mud. I don't think the spirit works with a stick in the mud. So I think that was such a great lesson for me, well, just yeah. showing up. Sometimes when you just don't feel like you've got it, yeah. pray for help and just show up and he, he'll, he'll step in. That's beautiful. It's really beautiful. And you know, he says, come see. He doesn't say, um, yeah, I'll send right, you a text. Right. You know, come see. He wants you to come and be present, and he'll do the rest. There was a, a worship concert a couple of weeks ago from, or no, it was last week with Michael W. Smith and my friend Jim Daniker, who's his musical director. Yeah. I was not in the mood. Believe it or not, that I happens. was not in the mood that night. And then Michael starts singing, Let It Rain. And yeah, God just seems to take hold of you and wrap his arms around you in such a profound way when you don't even want it, mm. but you're there, you're trying. you go, yeah. you go, you're trying, you're there. And then all of a sudden it's like, what was I thinking? You know, what was I thinking? Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, it, it's fascinating. Well, and, and along those, well, and along those lines, one more story that will hopefully confirms that I love this topic because I think we need to really understand this in the church that I attend the latter day, the church of Jesus Christ, the latter day saints, we have on Sunday, what's called the sacrament. And, uh, I, I 
am working to expand my interfaith knowledge, Paul. You're so good at this. It's it's somewhat similar to communion. And there's other, there's other, yeah, it is communion. And um, right, so you're you're partaking of a symbol that allows you to really focus and be present in that moment and understand, appreciate Christ. And then also sort of pour everything on him and just cast your burdens at his feet, confess your sins, everything. And I, Paul, I kind of fell into this pattern of self-deprecation and self-shaming and self, um, uh, I think, just injury, self-injury. And it's because I was just so frustrated with myself making the same mistakes. I almost feel like when I pray to God, I'm like, okay, I'm sorry for this. It's almost like God is like, you look, if you're going to make a mistake, try a new one just for fun. You just, just try something different, you know? It's like, come on, give me something new. <laughs> well, he's a carpenter. He likes yeah, to exactly. fix different the things same thing every over now. and over again, like with me. It's so, not the same treehouse. I'm sitting there, and I'm in the middle of communion here, and uh, partaking the bread and the water and symbol in symbolically of Christ and what he did for me. And I'm just ripping myself to pieces, like you're doing this. And I, and yes, I'm saying sorry, and I'm being repentant, which is important. I think it's really important to acknowledge and have a self inventory, and and but you don't want to get bogged down and do a downward cycle. So I remember I was struggling so bad. I'm like Jesus, please just help me to feel something that I'm doing right. Please just give me something. Throw me a bone. And I love what. God said to me in that moment. He could have said, well, Steve, he could have had a laundry list because I was doing lots of things. You know, you're, tr- you're, you're, you're doing this, you're, 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 uh, you're, you're a father, you know, you're making enough of a living, you have a home, you have a roof over your, and he could list all these things off. And honestly, I just would have put them all off. I just would have been like, yeah, but that's not, that's not good enough. That's not good enough. And I love what he said. He said, my dear son, there he is again. I love that you keep trying. And it was just this moment of like, I can always do that. I don't need to fill a list of requirements. I just need to know that he loves that I keep trying. And and that was such a great transformative yeah. moment for me, as, especially when I get into that cycle of negative self-talk. Hey, I'm still showing up. I'm still trying. And that's what he loves. And, and he loves me no matter what, but he especially loves, I think, when we really try and when we're really putting that effort so yeah. so getting back to the song sorry we're, we're still we're still off here so but the reason why i wanted to kind of set all that up is because we go through these this is our great um, connection with each other is suffering and struggle it is such a great commonality that we share as a human family that we underestimate significantly we all struggle and our struggles are unique but pain can be very very relative and and um can build our relationships with each other and struggle and and empathy is a divine gift from the Savior. And so I would suggest if you've never heard it, I'm going to go classical on you now, but you need to take down the barrier. If you if you think classical music, that's not for me, it's above me, it's below me, whatever, you got to break down that barrier. You have to listen to Samuel Barber's Adagio for String. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's a, it's, it's, no, it's a... It's a seven or eight minute piece. That's a long time for you. You know, skip and, we're in a skip and scroll culture right now. If it doesn't get us in 30 seconds, we're gone, you know, or 15 even at this point. But I want you to get down. I want you to lay down on the ground as you listen to this piece and turn off all the lights. And I want you to pour everything that is toxic in you. And I want you to imagine it just leaking out of you onto the floor and out of every, out of every pore that you have just leaking out. And I want you to imagine the life of your relationship with God. And if you're Christian, imagine Jesus's life, how he went, he grew line upon line, precept upon precepts. He grew in stature. He worked his, he, he, he learned his role. He, he suffered. He died for us. Eventually he was resurrected. And all of those things are built into this piece of music. And you can hear that depicted. But you can also hear your own Gethsemane, your own crosses that you have chosen to bear, and your own suffering, and how you can. And, and at the end of this, it's, it ends with a half cadence. That's a music theoretical term that means that it doesn't resolve. And there's tremendous beauty in the symbology of that last five chord. If you know your chords, it's a five chord. It's a half cadence. It doesn't resolve back to the tonic or the home chord. It stays on five because. It's, it's this eternal progression 
that we get to experience. And it's never over. It, it's God's love never ends. He's always there for you. So I want you to just get on the floor, find a comfortable position on a couch, or maybe it's uh, on a pad or something. Turn off all the lights and play this piece of music on a nice stereo system or even better in headphones. And I want you to just cry your way through it and just let it be a catharsis of your soul. And it's, I promise you that that will be a seven minutes so well spent that you probably will do want to do it periodically. It's sort of like this detox trend of juicing, you know, <laughs> like right now where everybody should detox every six months. Maybe you should detox musically with this piece of music. Anyway, if you haven't listened to it, you've got to do it. You, But don't listen, experience it. Don't just listen. You have to. Yeah. That That is by far one of the most powerful yeah. pieces. I endorse what Steve is saying. It is... It is just breathtaking. And so many musicians have used mm. that to create their hit songs. And it, yeah, it's just overwhelming. Steve, I wish we had. <laughs> yeah, sorry, we've been long winded. More time for, and, and I'm going to have to, I'm going to, I'm going to have to have you back on. And I, I am so grateful for you pouring out your soul and your passion, your love of your faith, of, your understanding of God. And, um, you know, I am so thankful for our friendship. I've learned so much about music from you. I'll go back into my home movies. And I remember the time we had every musician, every part of the orchestra in my living room, preparing for a, a concert where we raised money for families affected by congenital heart disease. Everyone donated their time. You worked your tail off. <laughs> and I feel guilty because I've contributed yeah. to your exhaustion. Yeah. So thank you, Samuel Barber, right. <laughs> for la- giving That's Steve time awesome. to process. <laughs> and understand how valuable you are to all of us. And we love you, Steve. Where yeah. can people uh, learn? I know you have your website, stephensharpnelson.com. You guys have a new album. That's right. Two new Piano albums. Guys, actually. Chill. Yeah, but there's actually two albums, Chill and Lullaby. Lullaby's coming out this Friday. Yeah, we actually did two during the COVID times. We just wrote a lot of stuff, and we took we took popular tunes, classical mm-hmm. tunes, uh, original tunes, and we brought it down to a level where you can just chill or even fall asleep to it because we were just hoping. Who doesn't, who doesn't want less stress and better sleep right now? Yeah, we're still doing music videos, so you can find us on YouTube. Just search The Piano Guys, or you can just type in cello. You'll find me, and um, you can... Uh, I just did a TED Talk recently uh, that that is about um, this reconnecting with loved ones that you've lost through music. So if you've lost someone you love and you're struggling to reconcile with that person or, or, or find them again, I walk you through an actual scenario. Uh, I actually walk you through a meditative exercise that connects you with the people that are still with you and interested in the details of your lives. Um, so that's an, that's something you can find. Just type in Stephen Sharp Nelson into YouTube. You can find that. You can find us on all the DSPs that uh, I you know, Apple Music, Spotify, all that stuff. You could just search for Piano Guys and or ask Alexa or Siri to play the Piano Guys. Aren't they I great? Enjoy what you hear. They're the best receptionists in the world. But I, I want to endorse Steve's TED Talk because he understands grief. The Piano Guys understand grief. I'm not yeah. going to tell you why, but yeah. go and listen to Steve's presentation. You will be enriched. Um, thank you. Again, Steve, thank you so much. I am so grateful for you. Paul, I love you so much. I appreciate what you do for this world. And I I very, very much appreciate what you've done for me and for my family. Love you too. Cause you took 